Good evening to you all. <coughs> My name is Christoph Barnes and I would like to welcome you to the Elser Institute and to the very first Supranational Criminal Law or SEL Lecture of the year 2019. And the SEL Lecture Series is a series on international criminal law that has been organized since 2003 in cooperation with the Coalition for the ICC and the Coalition Center for International Legal Studies led university. Now tonight's lecture is a special lecture as it involves a presentation of an already existing brief that we published a few months ago on the International Crimes Database, here. Um, and it's one of the three briefs that we selected in the context of a special project we initiated together with the uh, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, or ICY, to ensure that we could capture the valuable insights of the tribunal's former employees. And one of those former employees is sitting next to me, uh, Mr. Robert Eldekin. And tonight he will present on this ICD brief on appeals, on errors of fact, assessing the reputational consequences of the ICTY appeals chamber's interventionist approach. Mr. Eldekin studied in Oxford, London, and Princeton, and from 2006 to 2013, he worked on a series of Srebrenica related cases, Popovic et al., Tolimir and Maric, um, as a lawyer in the trial division of the ICTY's Office of the Prosecutor. And today, he continues to work in international criminal law in the Hague. So, Mr. Elegant, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And you have the floor. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. I have no idea how long this is actually going to take, because I haven't freeze or spoken. I haven't talked through the uh, brief to anyone apart from my three-year-old uh, son. So. <laughs> Uh, I will aim to be 30, 40 minutes, and if I'm getting too long, please throw things or do whatever British politicians do to each other when they want to speed up. <laughs> the brief that I wrote, uh, I saw a call for papers from the Asser Institute, and there was well, several subjects that I felt I had in me to write about, but one thing had often bothered me during my time at the ICTY, which was the degree to which there was or appeared to be interference with the ICTY trial chamber's judgments and often on grounds that I found hard to understand, uh, certainly in the context of which ICTY trials and trials of most of the other institutions in The Hague are run, namely very lengthy, very complex sets of facts that pretty much only those who have sat through the entire proceeding can have any hope to piece together coherently, um, probably even less hope to then summarize on paper their accounting for findings they may wait, that they may make in the end, which is why, as with everyone that I meet in the Hague, we all seem to think we have the hardest job around, but mm -hmm. it really is the judges who are at the pinnacle of, uh, of having the tough work to do. And it's against that backdrop mm -hmm. that I decided to look into this and I set myself up with what really amounts to more of a social science uh, assessment. I, I read through every single ICTY appeals judgment looking to identify where errors of fact had been uh, found mm -hmm. and then piece together some statistics which we'll come to later on. The consequence for me though of the appellate interference, the thesis is very simple. If you claim that you have capable and effective trial judges, claim that you give them a margin of deference in their factual findings, and then go ahead and anyway interfere with their trial findings, you're not doing your institution's legacy and reputation any favors. And as I'm sure we all know at the moment, the uh, <clears throat> reputation of international justice in The Hague is not at its best. I just pulled some screenshots from more recent news events, none of which put the work that people in this room are doing in the best possible light. And for that reason, I thought it would be fair to also assess on a more technical level what happens when we're talking about doing judging, doing appellate work, and having to establish a balance between the work that appeals judges, appeals chambers need to do in order to intervene, and also making a statement, even coming down to the basics of an allocation of resources, to say the trial chambers are doing what they need to do. We will leave alone almost everything that we can. 
I wrote up to make sure that we're all on the same page, the basics of what it is to hold a criminal trial. I don't need to read this out, but you establish a forum in which appointed people, be they in a common law system, juries, or here, or in civil law systems, qualified professional judges, get to assess whether charges brought against the accused are to be found, found established or not. As those who've been through trial work know, the uh, in terms of page quantities, there may be more documentary evidence coming in at trial than witness evidence, but the life of a trial is driven by the witness evidence that is produced by the office of the prosecutor, by the defense, and it's that evidence that tends to come under the most detailed scrutiny, partly because people's accounts become contradictory through repetition, through challenge, without necessarily calling into question the truth of the facts that they're supposed to be recounting. But you set up a forum where you have evidence being presented. You then have to make, in order to arrive at a judgment, findings of fact set against the framework of the applicable law for the crimes charge. Now, I was really trying to tease out what makes judging hard, and I came to the conclusion that the most obvious difficulty for a judge who likes to tie everything they can to the evidence before them is to make any finding at all about mens rea, about the mental element of crimes. And since we don't prosecute strict liability, no intent requirement crimes in The Hague, there is always a mental element involved, be it at a knowledge level for formulations like JCE 3 foreseeable crimes, be it at the level of the special intent for genocide. But to make a statement about someone's mental intent, you're having to say something about a fact that is directly unknowable. You can't know what is in someone else's mind. And I think that's always true. Please tell me if I'm wrong, but I sat through and racked my brains and thought back to my undergraduate philosophy days, and this seems to be a key tenet of humanity. We don't know what's in each other's heads. So that makes things hard. Um, you look at the example I've given first, and this is again staying with mens rea. When you're asking to establish some kind of persecutory intent based on victim's ethnicity, you're having to determine whether a killer has killed a group of people without thought, without consideration of that element, or they have done so holding the idea that their targets are chosen because of who they are based on their ethnicity. And where do you look for that? People tend not to go to call a psychologist. They don't do brain scans. Uh, you look for the kind of characteristics that would make it, based on normal understandings of human behavior, very strange indeed. In fact, <coughs> unreasonably possible that those people were killed other than because they belonged to the relevant ethnic group. So you look for who was killed, things an accused may have said or indicated about intentions, other elements of pattern that again, based on a very simple and basic understanding of how people operate, to say this sort of thing only happens when you hold the intent that we need to prove. Away from the mens rea example, I picked up one of the more challenging ICTY appeals judgments, and we'll get into some more details on that later, but in the Godavina appeals judgment, the challenge that was raised against the trial chamber's finding in relation to General Godavina and his co-accused alleged indiscriminate attacks on targets during Operation Storm was set up as a legal test, but one which was predicated on a remarkably complex factual assessment that comes down to the expected accuracy and error rate 
of artillery weapons. That's not something that I would venture is in the background knowledge of most people, be they lay jury members or professional judges, and the findings that were laid out in relation to that factual definition that was picked up by the trial chamber to say that if shells are falling beyond the radius of more than 200 meters from a legitimate identifiable military target, that is indicative factually of somebody intending to shell a target that wasn't that center point of the 200 meter radius. That got knocked down on appeal, but the point is the trial judges at first instance had to go through incredibly technical factual information to understand what this weaponry was capable of in terms of accuracy, formulate a legal assessment based on that, and then come to conclusions based on where shells actually fell in the relevant four towns. So finding facts, even in simple cases, if there's a mens rea element are hard, finding facts in a case like Olivina, even harder. On top of that, um, again, as I assume that the audience know by now, uh, cases at the ITTY took an awful long time. I worked there for six and a half years and worked through two and a half cases, which is not a very productive work rate if you're a domestic prosecutor, um, but it's fair game again in the A. As I say, complexity in fact patterns, lots of witnesses, lots of exhibits for people to take into consideration. And as one example, you can see the numbers on screen in relation to the Maddox trial. I didn't, I'm afraid, go and find out the exact number of transcript pages. Uh, I, again, a personal dislike is having conversations at work, particularly when I'm being given a task, uh, when I'm told how many documents I'm looking at rather than how many pages of documentation. Some documents are longer than others. So close to 10,000 exhibits, 600 witnesses. I would guess the trial record must have come in 50, 60, 80,000 pages of transcript thereabouts. Uh, so an awful lot of information to process. Plenty of space to find facts and plenty of space to make errors. The standard of review, uh, I picked through ICTY appellate jurisprudence and with very, very minor variations in wording that as I get into in my paper, uh, but they don't need discussion today, uh, they don't have any effect other than semantic variation. This is a standard applied at the ICTY in relation to appeals on errors of fact. No reasonable trier of fact could have reached the original decision. This test to be applied only where the error has occasioned a miscarriage of justice, which means that ancillary findings that may crop up in the judgment don't need to be tampered with if they have no impact on the outcome of the trial. And in other cases, you're again stuck with no reasonable trier of fact as your qualification. You're not being asked, as the appeals chamber, to review all evidence offered in the trial a second time round. You don't get to do that according to this standard. It wasn't always a story of how appeals chambers saw their role, but the definition that they claimed to adhere to was uh, as it's written there. There was also a principle of deference, so appeals chambers like to put down on paper a statement of the respect. They would show their trial chamber colleagues to say that we will not lightly tamper with findings you have made. And indeed, here's a standard that means that when we are tampering, we're saying something pretty important about those who found the fact in error. We're saying you have done something that no reasonable trier of fact could have done. To me, that's a fairly serious claim to level against the trial judge. I understand that in domestic practice, the UK standard, for example, is similar to this. 
the one difference that actually does have importance for ICTY cases, and again at other Hague institutions, is that almost all judgments do get appealed. There's no request for leave to appeal, generally from final judgment, certainly not for accused, so everything is up for grabs. Appeals judges do have the luxury of a lot of incoming work to do, but they claim that they should take their distance, should step back, and only intervene where the thresholds are met. Another useful point that came out from the first ever appeals judgment of the ICTY, and again reflecting long-standing uh, jurisprudence, is that two judges, both acting reasonably, can come to different conclusions <coughs> on the basis of the same evidence. Which again, intellectually, is actually quite a hard thing to grapple with. If you are making a finding, as I've kind of written up in pseudo legalese at the bottom, if you make a finding that fact X is the case based on certain evidence, your colleague or friend turns up and looks at the same evidence and finds not X, you certainly, I would revert to a position of, hey, let's just go through it again until I can persuade you. What I'm finding, I'm a reasonable person, and I can only come to X as my conclusion. If you're not getting to X, it's your reason that's wrong. It's not because this information has two entirely different meanings to two different people. But again, in the world of the complexity of facts with which ICTY chambers were presented with, it does make sense. You don't get to launch an investigation at the appeals level into a trial chamber finding just because you disagree with it. You have to make the precursor step of determining that that finding is one no reasonable trial of fact could have made. And that, again, intellectually is hard, and I would venture is not something that was always done in appeals chambers before they went off and decided to investigate what had actually been done by the trial chambers. So again, an invented example, but just to set up the basics to be on the same page. Simple trial, A found guilty of stabbing, oh sorry, A is found guilty of I think I've invented A and X as the same person. So I think X is found, being found guilty. X stabs Y in the chest in broad daylight. There's an appeal by X. X says that there's no mention of a weapon. No evidence came in a trial of the chest injury. And indeed, that is the case. The trial chamber simply got it wrong. They made a factual finding for which there was no shred of evidence in my invented scenario. No knife, no stabbing injury. The appeals chamber quite rightly says there is no way on earth anyone with a reasonable mind could have found what you found. That's not reasonable. It's a clear error of fact and there's a clear miscarriage of justice. That's nice and simple. Georgievich case, so the Office of the Prosecutor prosecuting a senior Serb commander involved in the crimes committed in Kosovo against Kosovo Albanians. One element of the case involved establishing Georgievich's knowledge of crimes happening in Kosovo. This paragraph notes that the trial, this is from the appeals judgment, notes a finding that Human Rights Watch was sending reports to the MOOP, the Ministry of Interior, <coughs> so the ministry responsible for Georgievich's police activities, uh, and these Human Rights Watch reports described crimes being committed by Serb forces in Kosovo. And the assessment here, no reasonable trial of fact could have inferred from the simple fact the reports are being sent by Human Rights Watch to Georgievich's ministry that he had personal knowledge. 
and then they go to explain in more detail why it is they find that no reasonable trial of fact could have come to this conclusion. Not <coughs> part of the internal organizational structure for reporting. No evidence that Georgievich had access to the internet and no evidence that, presuming the reports were sent in English, Georgievich could understand them. That's the factual counterpoint that the appeals chamber decided to make to the trial chamber's finding. Let yourselves think about it for a little while, whether you believe that evidence coming in of reporting hitting Georgievich's ministry, in which he is is he the head of the MOOC? Uh, I'm going to ask a colleague at the back. Is, was he head of the MOOC or was he just within it? Yeah, no. Okay. So he's the head of the MOOC, um, according to my authoritative source. Um, these reports are coming in. They're saying pretty astonishingly bad things about activities the MOOC is conducting in Kosovo. But no reasonable trial fact could use that as evidence that the man at the head of the MOOC knew the content of those reports. I'm not sure, frankly when I play appeals judge, that they really have fulfilled their own test. Yes, this is one of those ones where you might find X and your friend finds not X, but I don't find that logic compelling enough to do what we saw the test requires to be done. In any case, the appeals chamber here falls down on themselves because they say, well, there are also media reports of what's happening in Kosovo, this is coming out in CERB media, so we find that the trial chamber reasonably relied on other sources, and Georgievich did have notice of the relevant crimes. This would mean that the finding on the previous page did not in any way implicate a miscarriage of justice because the necessary notice is proven by other sources. And again, it's a side question, but of interest, why would the appeals chamber even find it necessary to write up this paragraph at all. No impact, an open question, ultimately doesn't go anywhere. But it does give a flavor of what I call the interventionist nature of ICTY appeals judges. I promised you Gotovina, which I will hold up my hands and say I don't understand. But the fact I don't understand it, and hopefully you will not understand it either, will be in itself instructive. I mentioned that the trial chamber had set up a fact-based legal test in order to determine whether or not certain shelling actions, artillery fire, directed by Gotovina and in conjunction with the other accused, were indiscriminate. And that was based on this assessment about if you're aiming at something, how far off can your shells fall, even if you really fully intend to hit the target at the center. The evidence that the trial chamber relied on was not extensively laid out in the trial judgment, but they did refer to three witnesses, each of whom gave some information two with some professional expertise, as far as I recall, of artillery. One was a Dutch military officer, and I forget if the other one was uh, somebody from the former Yugoslavia. And a third, as I remember, was an international witness who had been present on the ground and could give some accounting of the spread of the impacts. Here, the appeals chamber qualified this as a legal error, which again, given the subject of my paper and talk is of interest because fundamentally there's a factual error to be accounted for first before determining whether we're talking about a legal error. Have the trial chamber correctly assessed the facts that allow you to build up an appropriate legal standard? And there is no law on earth that I know of that tells you how accurate a weapon has to be. That's not something that gets maybe contract disputes for artillery manufacturers, but beyond that, nothing else. So you have a question of fact <coughs> imported into a question of law. Another head of challenge was that the trial chamber failed to provide a reasoned opinion to explain where the standard came from. 
but it can be derived. It's evident when you read the trial judgment that it's based on the witnesses that I mentioned. So you can see what was the evidentiary basis of the finding, but the appeals chamber then decide to go on and see what it means to be using this standard. They decide that the standard has not been appropriately established, and because of those errors, the impact analysis, which means the impact of shells falling on the ground, each one of those being an impact, that analysis cannot be sustained. And this does have consequences for justice. So again, recalling there was dissent in the appeals chamber, reversing this analysis, saying there's no basis, at least using a radius measure to say whether the spread of shelling on the relevant four towns was or was not indiscriminate, means that the conviction needs to fall away. No reasonable trial of fact could conclude beyond reasonable doubt that the four towns were subject to unlawful artillery attacks. So again, this finding of fact here, this uh, finding of error of fact by the appeals chamber <coughs> stands at the core of the acquittal that flowed in uh, this appeals judgment. And these things matter. And what I'm trying to get at, again, without fully understanding exactly how the mechanics of the initial 200 meter radius were established, nor how it was again beaten down on appeal, it reveals that when you're dealing with complexity and facts, being on solid ground is the only way to go. Now for my social science bit, which is, as I say, I sat down for far too many evenings searching through the appeals judgments and came up with this very pretty table. And there were a total of 40 appeals judgments rendered against substantive trial judgments at the ICTY in its existence. Uh, that's up to mid-2018, I think, when I finalized the paper. I didn't include sentencing appeals where the standards are different, nor any appeal where other events meant that the appeal proceedings closed before a final judgment was rendered. And as you can hopefully see, if the type is not too small, just over half. So in Britain, this would be the basis for a uh, successful Brexit. 53% of appeals judgments included findings of errors of fact in the trial judgments. It's not a perfectly increasing progression, but you can see that from the first tranche of appeals judgments that come after 1998, you start with a fairly low number from a small sample size, 14% of those judgments picked up a finding of fact that was erroneous, and then it goes up in, to a high majority of cases, uh, certainly in the final five years of the ICQI's existence. I wouldn't make any particular assessment as to why there was growth there, but again, the thesis that appeals judges feel some urge to intervene whether or not it is fully in accordance with the standards that they proclaim to work towards um, is, I would say, belied by that figure. And when it comes down to individual judges, again, this is kind of interesting because you end up with, hopefully according to accurate data, and if any students here have the time and the energy, you can probably tear this to pieces by reading all the same stuff yourself and finding out I've got a few things wrong. But to the best of my ability, I determined that there were 47 out of the 65 judges who sat on those aforementioned 40 trials, who then were responsible for the trial judgments. They didn't dissent, and therefore remove themselves from the group of minds who had made the finding nor were they reserve judges who had simply not participated in the judgment. So 47 out of 65 found to have done something that no reasonable trial fact could have done uh, in their trial. More interestingly, 30 found to have committed this heinous sin in two trials, and the two judges who 
I'll name this on screen, but I'll mention in my article, uh, were found to have done this three times around, which again, in I guess, US parlance, three strikes and you're out, uh, does not apply to the judiciary in the Hague. But it does say something because back to my initial broad description of how trials work, and what it means to do what even as a prosecutor I can admit is a harder job. Doing the hardest job in The Hague when you're the trial judge is quite hard enough. Trying to do the trial judge's job on appeal without spending the time, without hearing the evidence come in, without reflecting, can never achieve the same holistic finding of justice. You may find procedural errors in trial judgments. Gopavina, I would expect, could perhaps have been cured procedurally by having the judgment reviewed, redrafted, taking into consideration the criticisms that were then laid at the appeal stage, but of course, trial judges do not have their luxury. But you can see in Pokar's dissent from the appeals judgment, he's willing to defer to the trial chambers work and he believes that that's the good reason. Careful consideration of the trial record. I've spoken informally to some of the senior prosecution team who worked on Gotovina. Again, they never specifically proposed a 200 meter shelling radius as the basis for their claim that the indiscriminate shelling incidents were proven. They said, look, there was so much evidence in the case that the, the, the widespread, the almost random spread of shelling, that it could not have been an attack that was targeting military targets. Shells were falling all the way across these towns. You don't need an expert to tell you when that house has been blown up. You can put that on the map, look at the patterns, get the artillery experts in as well to remind you that these weapons are within the margins pretty accurate. That's what you should be finding on. And it is the bugbear, I think, of a lot of prosecution work is that you know that you can't piece together every single step of inference that a judge may need to make to get them over the line for the result you want. But you can hope that if they listen to everything, they can process the material cohesively and come up with a finding that based on the full range of evidence does justice. And that's effectively what Judge Pokar is getting at. Also interestingly, separately, is the Shabuddin separate opinion comment here, which is a reminder that at least in the ICTY structure, the appeals chamber was not a superior court. It was a separate chamber created to fulfill the review function to allow for parties who are effectively represented either by themselves if defendants decide they have their sufficient <coughs> to have their own knowledge to self-represent, but most generally by professional defense counsel, by professional prosecutors. These parties can pick up a trial judgment. If there's error, they can do the work of flagging it, reviewing the trial evidence, putting it before the trial chamber. It's not for the appeals chamber to say, look, we're the smartest guys in the room. We're round two, we're better than round one. Again, it's back to my favorite Brexit subject, but you have a second referendum because round two is better informed. Maybe you need a round three or a round four. It's very hard to set up a justice system with a flat structure such as the ICTY and then try to justify extensive appellate interference, particularly when the tools to do the job of retrying a small part or a larger part of any case are not on offer, namely the time and the evidence in front of them. I don't even know which way I'm going to point this. Is it that machine there? <laughs> um, okay, so one solution that Judge Schomburg suggested, and I quite like this, but I don't think it solves everything, is simply to rephrase the settled expression to say not that those judges who've been found to have made a factual error are themselves 
persons who have made the finding of a certain poor kind. It's to say that the error is that the finding itself is one which no reasonable prior of fact could have uh, come to. This is probably marginally an improvement for the reputation of the institution. It doesn't do very much, though, to pull back uh, an interventionist appeals chamber from feeling uh, the need to interfere. Indeed, it may be an encouragement because they will feel even less need to defer to their colleagues because they're not making any suggestion about their inherent capacity to do their judging work. My final suggestions, and again, these are top of the head ideas, but they do serve the purpose I've described, which is to place fact finding and concerns about fact finding back in the hands of the trial judges who have the ability to refer to evidence and to explain themselves based on the trial process. If you think that trials are worthwhile in themselves, this process of gathering evidence in front of the, the trial bench is worthwhile, then it makes sense to me to offer a mechanism for those judges to get to explain, to get to perfect if there is an error. Either by sending a case, part of a case back, or why not an informal consultation? Again, the open secrets in The Hague of what happens behind the closed doors of judicial chambers, who gets to write what, who actually writes evidence summaries, indeed probably who writes an awful lot of the content of the Gottavina judgment. Um, I would doubt that the judges themselves would, uh, would claim that they did all the work required. And if they're not doing all the work required, judicially, even within their own chambers, I don't see, at least again, top of the head thinking, any inherent harm to the interests of the parties for a cross-consultation to the trial chamber to say, we're thinking X, we don't like this finding of fact. Can you help us find the relevant evidence at trial that supported this? It may require some public perfection for the affected parties to be informed that yes, we're now using these elements to support the decision, allow challenge on those parts for a further appeal, but at least the work is being done by those with the greatest chance of getting it right. Or, again, as a throwaway suggestion, maybe the appeals chamber could just let the trial chambers alone as they claim to do. Or possibly granting the review proceedings in case of substantial reversal, reversal of the trial chamber findings, then the other parties will have the opportunity yeah. for a review. Yeah, exactly. Instead you you of leave the, open the, the door. High threshold now, just a new fact, or they could probably leave. Yeah, I think there's scope for it. You need to be cautious, but I don't see any more harm from that than the potential harm from the world knowing that judges don't write all their judgments. So, um, yeah, and it, it, again, back to the social science -y part of this, but there's a judicial system, or many systems, all doing international justice in The Hague. You want to have systems that give you results that are fair, impartial, um, at least impartial until you finally determine whether a party is uh, guilty as charged or not, and also a question of allocating resources, which is behind my thinking of putting the work to be done by those best placed to do it. So those are my thoughts. I'm more than happy to answer questions, but I probably do not have any good answers. So show me some deference and uh, yeah, we'll see what <laughs>